Hi, uh, welcome to GRC and Me, a podcast where we interview governance, risk, and compliance thought leaders on hot topics, industry-specific challenges, and trends to learn about their methods, solutions, and outlook in the space, and hopefully have a little fun doing it. Uh, I'm your host, Chris Clark. Uh, with me is Praj Prayagdev. She has over 18 years of IT audit, risk, and compliance experience at big four and top tier financial services companies. And we're excited to get to talk a little bit about building a culture of risk, what cyber risks keep Praj up at night, and the growing sophistication of cyber risks. Praj, do you mind telling us a little bit more about yourself? What's been your journey in GRC? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be here. And I'm Pratch, like Chris said. I have had a pretty long and interesting journey in GRC. I do have a computer uh, science background. So I started my career kind of within the technology and technology audit space. And I spent the first half, which is now growing shorter as, as I spend more of my second, uh, second part of my career in risk. But the, I spent the first few years in technology audit, kind of solidifying that audit compliance mindset across like big fours and, you know, that was the era of socks and everything was about socks, right? So um, it was that. And then I jumped over into technology risk and now it's evolving into obviously cybersecurity risk and GRC. So I have uh, about 18 years in this field and I've spent the last, you know, seven, eight years in like leadership roles. I spent the last five years at my last company, which was Horizon Media, building up their entire GRC program from scratch, which was a very interesting and satisfying challenge. So um, that's a little bit about me. I live in the North Jersey, like Manhattan, close to New York City metro area. And I have a seven-year-old boy and a husband who also works in tech, but also has a band in the city. Very cool. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that. You, um, I, I think your background's so interesting and in just the way you write, like the kind of the IT audit, but the way it's kind of naturally evolved with the technology. I, um, I, this is something I'm interested in, but I, for someone who is, you know, either who is in their career in GRC, I, I'd be interested. What's your, what's your top piece of advice, uh, for a GRC professional? Right. So I think, look, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question, but I'll touch a little bit on what you said about the IT audit, right? I think that being across audit is a little bit more rigid than being across uh, risk or GRC. But if you do it in the beginning of your career, I think it really helps solidify your understanding of controls, compliance, risk, definitions, um, and the knowledge around all of that, right? So I think that my advice for people who are getting into the GRC field or, or aspiring to be in the GRC space is spend some time strengthening your fundamentals, whether those fundamentals are a deeper understanding of technology, whether those fundamentals are a deeper understanding of compliance, that of controls, that of kind of the basics of auditing, you kind of know, uh, you know, based on your educational background and what experience you've had and where you are in your career, you'll be able to identify those. But I think it's very important to strengthen those fundamentals because when you're in a GRC program, there's a lot of room for innovation. So if you're in the right space uh, with the right people, I think you it, there is scope to become a thought leader at every level. You don't necessarily have to be a director um, or a VP to be a thought leader in the GRC space because it's such an evolving space. It's um, growing, it's branching out, uh, kind of interfacing with so many different areas. And I think there is so much scope for us to add value to our technology goals and our strategic goals as an organization, even business goals, not just technology goals through the GRC program and move away from like the whole cost center mentality. So I think it really helps to send it in your fundamentals across those areas and like talk the talk with your technology leaders and your business leaders and your auditors. That's awesome. I love that. Now I need to, I'm going to go brush up on my fundamentals right after this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we've got a great bunch of great topics on cyber risk, but I kind of always like to start with uh, this concept of risk management in your daily life. Um, one thing, so I live in Texas. Uh, we're going through a heat wave right now. 
Um, so it's 115 degrees outside. But one thing that I started doing is uh, I recently like bulk bought sunscreen and I've started, you know, there's a, there's a very high risk of sunburn now yeah. everywhere you go. And I have a two-year-old. Uh, so for them as well, I just try to be like hyper on top of it, but I've actually started hiding sunscreen bottles in all the different bags that we have just because you never know. So it's in the car, it's in our, you know, diaper bag, it's in um, my backpack, like any time now where we go. Um, and the goal of that is, you know, we have a pretty high sunburn risk, but I'm mitigating my forgetfulness by putting things where they naturally are. Um, so I'd be interested in, um, so that's my, my daily risk management, but I'd be interested in like what, uh, if you have any examples of how you think about risk management kind of in your day to day or in outside of work. Yeah, I know that's a very interesting question. Um, and I think risk management is very embedded into our life, right? But it's very dramatically different based on your personality. And I think some people are, are, are you know, more kind of like, I'll deal with it, that, with it as it comes. And, you know, if that's not going to happen. And, you know, the likelihood of that happening is like almost zero. And I, I don't want to think about it. And some people are, well, I want to be prepared just in case. So I think um, uh, both of those can play interesting roles in, in your journey. I see career, both of those personalities, but I am one of those that is always kind of, I would like to be prepared in case that happens. So, um, so yeah, I do a lot of what you just said, you know, it's uh, when we're traveling, we have checklists and we, me and my husband are sharing the checklist like a week before and just kind of doing little, little tasks daily because we're, we're both busy and we don't want to kind of um, find out the day before we're leaving that, oh my God, we're missing like 10 things on this list. And so um, that so being I'm a I'm a huge planner like uh, anytime we go to so, so so we went to Disney World last year and it last spring and it was I think pre COVID it was a little easier but post COVID they had so many like reservations and now like this this fast fast system like it's 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 all a little bit different and complex and I think it overwhelms some people and then they land up standing in line so. I think my husband says like you won Disney because I planned it to such a T that we didn't stand in a single line. <laughs> so we obviously had you know fast passes and stuff everywhere, but even then there's a, there's like a method to it. There's an app and there's a reservation system, so it overwhelms a lot of people. But I made sure to kind of study it and make sure that we we were going there with like my then um, I guess my son was five then and we did not want to have, have you know whining standing in lines uh, in the in the florida heat so yeah we basically didn't have to stand in a single line and we did every single ride on our list and i think that was because of planning and because of that risk mitigation mindset that okay in the event that you know we there is a line and we have to stand in it like how do i how do i plan this and structure this in a way that this becomes an enjoyable experience for us that we are focused on enjoying what the rides are giving us rather than the pain of standing in lines and, you know, going through the heat and all of that, because I think that takes away from the enjoyment and everybody comes out like, oh my God, I need a vacation after this. This was crazy, blah, blah, blah. So I think that I personally think that uh, planning and risk mitigation in your personal life gives a lot of comfort and gives a lot of, um, you know, foresight um, into what can happen and especially as you have children but that doesn't mean that's the only way to live there is also a lot of um, you know I think maybe overkill that comes with uh, with it so I do appreciate the other personality that that doesn't yeah. go so far down that road as well that's um I love that and I mean you're you're using risk as a strategic advantage right like you planned it out uh, you maximize your enjoyment coming off, like benefiting from that yep. fast pass. And it's interesting that you say that. Um, we should, well, we could probably do a whole podcast episode on um, yes. <laughs> difference in risk appetite thresholds between you know partners. Exactly. My, yep, exactly. Because I'm I'm similar to you, where if I'm going on a trip, I'm packing the night before. Um, there's a yeah. checklist. I literally will go like top up on like choose sock, like everything that I could wear. My wife we'll wake up 30 minutes before we're going to leave. And that's when she packs everything. And it, yeah. I'm like, how can you li like live like that? That's I, how could you sleep going into that? Um, so yeah. I, I love that example. Um, so I guess jumping now, right. We're, we talked we're, the example you gave is a little bit about like culture of risk, but 
um, you know, you've been a part of a lot of different organizations of different sizes and, you know, as a, you know, an auditor, you know, uh, probably an individual contributor, the director level. And how have you built a culture of risk in these organizations that you've been a part of? So, look, that's, there's no one short answer to that question, but I think that overall, um, and again, your contribution obviously does depend on your level, but I think overall, it is very important to have senior leadership um, buy-in into building a culture of list, risk, they are going to want to do it. So there, it, it needs to be done at a few different levels. So at the C level, um, you need to have you need to have the C levels believe that the man, mitigating the risk, managing the cyber risk or information risk, creating a GRC program is something that's going to benefit your organization. Now you also, as a leader of the GRC organization, need to strategically align your goals to that of technology and business. And I, I don't mean one-on-one, -on -one, that, that's not going to happen, but you need to create your strategy such that you're enhancing their strategy, you're helping them, you're um, kind of driving their growth rather than pulling them down. But at the same time, you need to get their buy-in on making sure that they do embed risk management practices as a part of their, um, as a part of their culture, right? So there's, there's the reactive part of it and then there's the proactive part of it. So a lot of times companies get a, very caught up in the reactive part of it. And I think that speaks volumes about how leadership has looked at it, right? I think good leaders need to take time to take a step back and build a proactive strategy for risk that is embedded into their culture. So they need to, you know, talk to their technology teams and leadership about risk. They need to make sure that everyone's aware of what's coming. Everyone understands its value. Um, there's enough security awareness. There's enough training. And they need to remove the busy work from managing risk and focus on building relationships and understanding and building that strategic value together as a team. So I think all of these can be done at various levels, um, but I think the buy-in is, is definitely key and, and it's important. But once you do have the buy-in, I think you need to do it at various levels. So just kind of giving you an example, you know, let's say you're an individual contributor and, you know, you're, you're kind of managing risk and there's a risk that comes your way, right? Instead of taking a more policing approach and kind of leading with fear, saying like, if you don't remediate this, you're this, this, these are the consequences, which, you know, you do have to set up consequences. That's a part of accountability. You do have to set up tracking and, and all of that and dates. However, there's also another aspect to it where you, you as a risk analyst partner with your technology organization to find a solution that works because your technology organization doesn't understand risk. You're supposed to understand the risk, the likelihood, the impact, the analysis, and you're supposed to guide them into what is the solution that enables our business to achieve their goals while mitigating or lowering this risk. Now, that doesn't mean this is not a unicorn where, you know, every time you'll have that solution, but that's, that, that needs to be your approach. And that's how you will spread that culture of accountability because then they will, they will rely on you as their advisors in order to make sure that they are doing that. And eventually a very mature risk program across an organization needs to include risk advisors in their daily business solutions. You're building a new application, you need to have risk advisors from your GRC team that will guide you into implementing those controls before your application is built. You don't have to wait for the application to get built and then for you, for someone to go in and do an assessment and you point out like 15 different things that you need to mitigate, which is now you wasted everybody's time. So I think that's the goal. And these are the steps that we need to take from each level. Most organizations are, are not there um, on that, um, you know, in that sort of mature space to where we can embed risk into everyday decisions because it's a relatively new field. But I think I have seen organizations take some tremendous strides on creating that accountability culture by continuous partnership, continuous innovation, growth, continuously, uh, you know, believing in the risk organization, giving them the autonomy to, to buy tools, to build the program, to um, build relationships, to understand that and drive that. I loved all of that. The, I feel like oftentimes we, 
as you're going through these programs, you're going to hear, you know, that exactly what you said. It's really tough to get the business to buy in on the risk management piece. And so much of that, I, I think, tends to be because um, compliance can be and like risk can be seen as kind of like the stick or the enforcer rather than the carrot of like how. And so the the part that you mentioned around like there's goals at the top that the yep. senior and like aligning those, that's such a powerful shift in thinking that yes. I think really like could benefit just organizations. I absolutely agree. I think that shift in thinking is absolutely needed as we grow from, yeah, you know, the whole, our whole world was socks, like I said, 20 years ago, as we shift from that to a more sort of sophisticated, mature, embedded risk culture and a GRC program that's based on that, I think that culture shift is needed because we don't want to be the cost center, right? The CISO organization, um, I think, plays a very pivotal role. There's a, there's a huge push now to get even cybersecurity advisors on the board. So I think that you know that that itself is a is is an indicator that people are now thinking about embedding risk culture right from the board level all the way down down to an individual contributor level. And like I said, organizations are in different you know spaces, and a lot of them are still stuck in the traditional mindset. But I think it's it's that cultural shift is very significant, and I think that it is going to lead to. Um, some great waves in the way that GRC programs are built and going to lead to some easy collaboration. Like I've seen this even in some top tier banks that I work with where they had like an advisory, um, you know, section of the site of their uh, technology risk program where anytime technology leaders were undertaking like a significant change or a significant project, you know, they were coming to the technology risk organization to understand the risks and be proactive about it. And I think that's fantastic. So it definitely needs to get out of that policing audit mindset where it's like, you know, you, you got to do this because I'm telling you to do it. Like that, that only takes you so far. And I think as more and more modern organizations with a more collaborative and flatter culture emerge, I think this approach is going to be significant. Yeah. And it, it's interesting that 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 shift in mindset is then seeing the results of having people added to the board. And um, along those lines, I'd be interested where, how do you, as someone who is technical and working in this like tech risk space, um, how do you communicate those kind of technical risks to people who aren't technical? Yeah. That's always a challenge. And I think the important thing to focus on is what are we helping them achieve, right? So, you know, I, I believe in kind of, you know, the, the the there's a word that's circulated everywhere that, you know, I'm a servant leader. I don't particularly like that word, but I think what it means is that you are, as a leader, you are here to enable your team to succeed and enable your organizational organizational leadership to achieve their goals. So I think it's important to understand what is it that you're expecting from them and what's the value add to them from this, right? Are you just telling them, I want you to fix this risk because I'm in this position and I, I can tell you to fix this risk. Um, that, that typically doesn't fly. So I think you need to, um, as a leader or even as an, obviously definitely as an individual contributor, you need to A, understand the impact. Impact analysis, of a risk is, is very significant most of the time because every risk will have a different impact on the business. And if your risk that you're asking them to spend, I don't know, maybe like 15 or 25 hours of their staff time to mitigate uh, has zero organizational impact on their team's goals, then no matter how much you explain it to them, you're, you're not going to be able to get them to justify spending that time on mitigating that risk, right? So I think that business impact of the risk, um, of the technology risk is very important. And then to be able to translate that impact on what it means to them on a, on a daily basis. So for example, you know, you have a, you have, you know, data retention risk or business continuity risk, like rather than kind of framing it out that way, you need to show them what productivity impact that might have on their business, right? Maybe try to quantify it for them uh, based on the application that you're talking about so you can't like 
you don't want to necessarily silo them into um, a compliance or an expectation, although that's necessary if you, your organization is subject to fines and stuff that is a part of the impact. But I think it is also important to paint that picture for them and understand how it would matter to their org, their team, their goals. And I think that's where the translation is key. So, you know, I mean, leaders do understand technology, but they understand how, what technology, as a, they understand it as a user. They understand it in a way that what does this technology do for me to achieve my business goals? And that's how you should talk the talk with them. And that helps tremendously, I think, because they, they are not looking for you to say, you know, um, oh yeah, this change doesn't do according to this compliance, according to this standard, blah, blah, blah. You're trying to do this and, you know, this is going to, they're looking to see, okay, what does this, what does this mean to me? Like, is my productivity going down? Are my people going to get locked out of the system? Can people steal my data? Uh, can this affect my clients? Can this affect my reputation? So I think that analysis, far too many organizations spend time, you know, creating busy work around the risk management and not doing enough analysis on them. And I think that's where efficient tools come into picture, where you reduce some of that burden and create a more proactive approach and spend some time, your staff needs to spend less time entering information and tracking things rather than they need to spend more time actually analyzing what that means for your organization and then help your help drive um, the mitigation of that risk or, or acceptance. I mean, however it works out from the appetite perspective. Yeah, that's uh, that's so fascinating because to your point, uh, so much of this like technology is just it's just a tool. It's just a way to achieve some other goal. It's a facilitator rather than the the end all be all of it. Right. So helping, like understanding that what you're doing impacts the technology, but the technology impacts. There's like there's always a so what question. Yeah. Finding that and like helping leaders and and just anyone who needs to help understand that's really powerful yeah exactly um i'd be interested like that's that's it's cool to hear about from you know how risk can achieve those things i'd be interested in then like how do you report on the health of what you've achieved are there types of reports that you find are powerful to show to the board or to communicate the outcome of that risk program yeah, no, that's that's an interesting question, and I think it's 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 an ever evolving one. So I think as a community, we're still trying to figure that out. But I think metrics or reporting um, it, it varies tremendously at, at each level, right? So you know, as a leader of the risk org, I'm more interested in operational metrics to understand you know what volume we're we're high, uh, handling and how is that impacting my team's productivity and how's you know how much of that reactive versus proactive are we doing and how much process change is helping and and where do we need to fix challenges and problems but i think when you start talking about the board and the sea level it's very important to focus on trending i think for for the sea level and for the board right because they're not interested in the details of how many risks we've mitigated last month what they're interested in is are we evolving as an organization are we growing are we are we better this month than when we, than we were last month? Or maybe month is an overkill last quarter. Are we better this quarter than we were last quarter? And they're not interested in the operational methods that we've used to get us to that space. I mean, in a good way, obviously, you know, good leadership is interested in what you've done, but not at that detail level. So I think it's very important to show the trends and show the organizational impact of the trends. So I think that, you know, an easy win for a risk management organization is always the security awareness training and phishing and all that, right? Because all of the C-suite and boards and everything is against it. But I think that if we can show trending on, you know, how we help lower the risk of our top tier organ or top top tier applications, how did we help? our organization get certified for certain compliances because we had a proactive risk approach and made sure that we did a self-assessment and fixed those risks before the external regulators came in to evaluate us. Um, they're interested in that, that sort of stuff, right? Are there any critical gaps that we've identified that technology leaders are now working on um, that, that 
you know, could have led to data loss or breaches or, you know, how are we protecting our information assets and how is the risk organization proactively helping the technology organization manage their resources, manage their funds, manage their uh, time in order to protect our information assets and how we're doing better on that this quarter than last quarter should be the theme of what we're presenting to the board. I think that's what they're interested in the most. So I think that's where analysis at every level is helpful because you want to make sure that, you know, you, you again, the proactive approach and analysis to all of your metrics that you have tiered metrics where you have the ability to analyze that trend that. Um, so, you know, for example, sometimes you do, sometimes you have a bunch of critical risks come up one quarter and then they disappear the next quarter and then you have more critical risk the quarter after. So it goes up and down, right? But there's always a story to be told behind that. And I think that we need to present that story, if applicable to the board, in a way that we're translating it into organizational impact. And I think that's that's the key. And when you say organizational impact, um, have you found that turning that into dollars and cents is has been like the best of the story? Is it keeping it like, is there a metric or number that helps with that? Or does it tend to differ based on the type of risk and the type of problem that is arising? So look, metrics and numbers always help um, with the board and sea level. But I think that risk can also be subjective. So I think it's not always possible to quantify risk. It's possible to quantify the compliance piece of it, right? We, you know, if we weren't compliant, this was our fine and this is what we were subject to and this is the regulation and then this is what we, like this is how we became compliant. From a risk perspective, purely outside of the compliance um, umbrella, I think sometimes you can't quantify it. So I think then it's important to understand the organizational impact on the business. Like, did it help us get more clients? And again, you can't quantify and claim that all of the money that you've gotten through clients is because of the risk on. So you can't, can't quantify it, but has it helped you get clients? So, um, you know, for example, clients expect organizations to have a stable third-party risk program if they're allowing you to handle their data. So how robust is your third party risk program? And if that has been robust and it has been iteratively kind of getting to a very mature space, then that's one way you can show organizational impact where it's helping you drive business because when clients come and ask your business teams like, hey, we're actually giving you data and you're our vendors. And if you're sub subcontracting that to like 10 different vendors, how stable is your program? And what do you do from it? And then, how do you manage the risks from it? That goes back to having a risk register and having that program stable. So I think that that sort of impact, not necessarily in terms of dollar amounts, but that sort of impact is significant on an organization or um, you know, your CIO. Um, you can help the CIOs drive, like I said, budget and projects pretty significantly. So like, okay, you had critical risk in, across these tier applications and um, there wasn't enough people there or there wasn't enough funding and there were some things that were preventing us from mitigating those risks and we worked out solutions from there or we lowered that risk from critical to low by fixing half of the things and now uh, the data that decides in those applications is, is secure and we've reduced the possibility of a data breach or we've created efficiency um, in change management because of our, our, our application development life cycle because of the fact that you know, we've embedded risk while we are implementing the change. Stuff like that. These are just examples. But they, there is a lot of qualitative analysis that you can do surrounding risk that the board would be interested in. But I think that the program has to be a little bit more mature for that because in order for us to get to that point, we have to have a strong operational program, which, again, I go back to this. I... Um, I had spoken at Agility about the building a high value risk program and my, my method. It talks about this people process technology method, right? Where, where you will, neither of those can actually build a strong risk program in entirety by itself. You can't just have people and have them do busy work and don't give them, not give them the right tools. That's not going to give you anything. You can't just have a tool and not the right people um, to actually use that tool. And you can't have an inefficient process 
that you've built into the tool or have the people work. So I think that if you build your risk program uh, with with the, the combination of these three, and I won't go, go down, you know, super into detail on that because I think I'm, I'm kind of digressing from your question, but I think if you build that in a, in a certain level of, strength in terms of its foundation and then you build on that into a mature program then you will be able to assess that risk and present the larger organizational impact whether that's quantified or more of a qualitative opinion but it would it will be there i mean it makes a ton of sense right you need to go back to the one thing you said at the beginning of there's this top-down approach of risk of building that culture but in the same way when you're going back up, you need to start with the basics, that foundation of people processing technology. And and it's almost a bi-directional approach to risk management because the tone's at the top, but it's a bottom-up escalation of risk that helps tell the story of what the team is doing and what they need to know from a risk perspective. Um, One thing I'd be interested in is like, what keep what always makes me worried is this concept of like unknown unknowns of you know if you don't if you're not aware of a risk then you can't really mitigate it but i'd be interested in um like what keeps you up at night around your risk management program you know where what are you worried about so i mean that differs from organization to organization because challenges differ but i think i'll ask answer a question more as a risk professional, not really specific to organizations, right? So I think as a risk professional, what would keep me up at night is is really what you said, the unknown, which is not having enough avenues to identify risk. Because the you can, I mean, I get that, you know, you don't know what you don't know. But I think that a huge part of a stable, mature risk program is making sure that you've identified every every avenue for actually, you know, identify every avenue to identify risk. I, I apologize for the double identify there, but there's no better way to put it is that, you know, you need to make sure that you understand where your technology risk comes from and make sure that all of that is assessed and analyzed. So it can come from, you know, your vendors, it can come from pen tests, it can come from vulnerability assessments, it can come from audits, it can come from your control self-assessments, it can be self-reported, it can come from your application development life cycles, it can come from technology orgs, it can come from architecture, it can come from application security orgs. And I think the size of that can be so overwhelming for some organizations or even the inclusion process of that can be so overwhelming that people never get there. Like they just kind of have a few uh, streams going into your risk register or your risk program and the others are just floating. Um, they're just kind of like, oh yeah, so so there is a lot of risk in that specific team or org, but nobody's ever tracking it, right? It doesn't matter whether you're, I mean, it does matter whether you're mitigating or accepting. You don't obviously want to accept all the risk, but there will always be certain amount of risk that you're accepting. And that's where your you know, risk tolerance comes into picture if you have an ERM program, like an enterprise risk program. But I think what is scarier is to not know where that risk um, exists and where that risk sits. And I think for that, um, it is very important. Again, I go back to the people process tools thing because it's very impo- it's not possible to do this manually. So it's very important to have the right tooling in place where the tool is able to capture all that risk. And, you know, there's either that's automated through interfaces, self-reported, whatever you erect. I think it's very important for us to capture that and analyze that and then have the resources from a people perspective to actually help um, us figure out the treatment of that risk. So I think that unknown is what, as a risk professional, would keep me up at night. And then the, 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 the T-shaped things of the phishing attacks and stuff that everyone talks about, that that's always there and that's never going away. But I think this, from a purely sort of GRC technology risk perspective, I think this is what organizations struggle with the most that can have the largest impact on their organization. That's so fascinating. Yeah, the the just having that list, just knowing where the risk can come from is such a big piece. And, you know, 
I guess, uh, like asking for a friend, can you send me that list whenever you get a chance? Yeah. <laughs> but I can have it. <laughs> um, but I appreciate you sharing that. We're yeah. uh, one thing building off of that that I think would be interesting is, um, you know, technology is accelerating at such a rapid pace. Yeah. How, how do you recommend risk professionals keep up with that? That um, that definitely is a challenge. Um, and especially now, you know, since there's like we moved on from like on-prem and mainframes to like cloud and cyber. And now we're talking about AI. And so it's, it's, it's always very rapid. I think in the last 20 years, technology has moved at breakneck speed. And I think that it, it, it is it is a continuous challenge for risk professionals to keep up with it. But I think, and we're never going to be fully ahead of that challenge because technology is going to keep evolving, right? I think what is important to is to have a growth mindset. This is something that uh, my seven, now seven-year-old's kindergarten class taught him. And I thought it was so interesting. Uh, they told him about um, a still mindset and a growth mindset and about how a growth mindset is very important in life to overcome challenges. So, you know, from their perspective, obviously, it meant, you know, not having, you know, tantrums if, if, they, if their, um, you know, pencil breaks and stuff like that. But I think it it was profound. And I actually adapted it and, and talked to my te- team about it when, when he learned that, because I think that while we can't ever get ahead of that technology, I think having that growth mindset means that we are close to the technology business as an org. Um to understand where they're adapting the technology, how are we moving as an organization to meet our business needs by changing our technology, and then as a CISO org or as a tech risk org, how are we staying abreast of those changes and making sure that we are, you know, we are increasing our knowledge and adapting our risk practices to incorporate those changes. So I think that's that's sort of a mindset that we need to have in every organization that we work as risk risk professionals. That necessarily may not mean taking a training course or a certification. It may mean so in some situations, and that's great if it's kind of laid out there like that. But in some situations, it simply means building those relationships to stay stay a breeze of those changes, to stay ahead of those changes, to understand what's coming, to understand, you know, what's, what's going to happen if those changes were to materialize, what's the business impact, how do we change our processes and our procedures to um, be applicable to that. So, like, if we use the same kind of set of questions as we did for our on-prem applications for our cloud ones, it's just going to kind of create a lot of unnecessary busy work. Like, some of it may apply, but some of it just won't make sense. So I think just kind of staying ahead of that curve in your organization and a breach to that, I think goes a long way. I mean, there's always going to be, like I said, you know, certifications and training classes, and I, I value them tremendously. So I think they will help. But the ultimate goal is to have that mindset that we're going to grow with organizational change. And then in turn, I think, um, you know, I'm not a CISO, but you know, I've worked with a fantastic CISO in Horizon Media, and, and I will, I will, and, and I know a bunch of inspirational CISOs. So I will speak from you know that mindset as to you know a good leader will always make sure that that organizational change is communicated and make sure that the pace matches and make sure that he's empowering his own leadership or, you know, as a risk leader, I'm empowering my team with the tools that they need to be able to scale to that change. And then that's why even in terms of GRC tools, I I place a great deal of, um, I place a great deal of attention or I place a great deal of um, what's the right word I'm looking for, basically importance to scalability of a tool because as organizations adapt and they go through change, if you have a tool that doesn't allow you to quickly change, if your tool takes six months of, you know, 20 professional services, professionals and a whole ticketed change management process and blah, 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 blah to make an organization and make a change to the tool because of a change, your organization's changing again in those six months. So, I mean, not that I, you know, I'm not undermining the controls behind change management, but I think that it's important for your risk program to be scalable. In- 
in terms of tools, in terms of process, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, making sure that process changes can be quickly adapted into the tool. People can be trained quickly as technology evolves. I think that's how we, we uh, keep ourselves, you know, at pace with that change. Even though technically we cannot ever outpace technology change, we can at least, you know, make sure our program remains current and relevant and, and adds equal amount of value as we go through that change. I love the growth mindset piece. I think there's, I think there's so much, um, well, I don't want to say growth, but like value that becomes unlocked when you stop thinking of learning and development as something you do after your job, but start thinking of it as a core piece of what you're supposed to be doing every day. Yeah. And it like, it almost, um, it almost takes away the guilt of, of that in some ways in, in approaching that, um, like in your day to day, because it's helping to your point, it's helping manage those risks. It's helping address those technologies. It's helping adjust the change. Um, so, so that's so powerful. I, um, you know, you, um, sort of maybe use a real example, um, with emerging technology. What do you, um, what should risk professionals be thinking about with AI? That's or artificial intelligence. Yeah, so that's I mean that's certainly you know um, the topic of the hour. It seems to be discussed everywhere, right? So I think AI does have tremendous usage in a risk program. I think especially in things like policy management, third party risk. So I did a couple of like brainstorming sessions with some startups and um, even some researchers in Stanford that kind of approached me on LinkedIn to to brainstorm about usage of AI in risk management. And I think that it does have tremendous potential. So I'll give you an example, you know, with your third party program, there is there is so much that you need to kind of read documents and populate. So, you know, you're, you're, scan, you're reading policies, you're reading SOC reports and stuff. AI can read that for you and pre-populate the fields. Um, you, in terms of control self-assessments, if people are, again, providing you their, their, their policy, their procedure documents within the organization, let's say you're doing a self-assessment over a change management process and you have your five controls laid out and some a team gives you their procedure document, you can identify the controls and map your control activity was control objectives there. Um, I think that there is a lot of sort of reading and feeding data work that AI can do for you in risk management. And I think that needs to be embedded um, as risk management tools or GRC tools evolve and that space evolves. I think the the ones that come out at the top and the ones that I think keep a base of this will be the ones that incorporate uh, AI as a part of their offering. So AI shouldn't be like an additional thing like, oh yeah, let me add AI. It's not like that. I think that's, we have to adapt our process to include AI in that, right? So how it's a part of the, the growth of the process that we're now, my, my aim has always been to automate and create efficiency and reduce busy work. And that's, I think I have stood by that literally since I started working in risk management. I was at Comcast and I remember my, I had an amazing uh, leader there and, and I had a little downtime and I went to her and I said, you know, I, ha- I, ha- I have some downtime and I'm going to re-engineer our, we had Archer at that point for GRC. I'm going to re-engineer our uh, process in our GRC tool. and. That became like a full-blown project that saves, saved us a million dollars just because of the way it was configured. So I think that that's that's how I look at AI. Like it's a part of that process re-engineering. It's a part part of that. It needs to be embedded in the tools. Obviously, we're not there yet, but that's what people and tools need to start looking at. That you know, how are we making this process more efficient with the help of AI and embedding that as a part of you know our offering. Where I think we need to be very careful is to not take away that analyst mind and give that to AI. I think that is where a risk expert and the subjective analysis and experience of people comes into picture, right? So I think that AI can be of immense benefit to create more automation, more efficient processes, reduce that like overload of scanning through documents, managing policies, and then give, give that leaving us more time for analysis. So hopefully, you know, organizations that are looking to 
go from a huge scale of maturity can hopefully get there faster because you know now your tool is doing more busy work that's allowing you to you know for, for your that's allowing you to actually empower your people to focus on risk analysis focus on building relationships focusing on being more focus on being more proactive focus on embedding yourself in that risk culture that i talked about earlier so it doesn't mean that i'm looking for ai to replace people which seems to be the common like fear and myth going around everywhere ai is going to take my job ai is going to take my job that's i think ai is just one of the tools that we have for something that we should be doing on an ongoing basis anyways we should be looking at growth we should be looking at automation we should be looking at reducing our busy work and we should be looking at replacing that with more analysis more embedding more advisory work within the organization more kind of integration into your business practices and for that uh, we need strong people so i think that you know co- contrary to popular belief of ai taking over jobs i think that it's a very clear distinction between what ai can do for you at least in the risk field and how it can enable people to do better and make your risk program uh, a, a better success for the organization I, I love that. And it's what you just said is such a, it's been a theme of what you've talked about of, you know, technology is a tool and it's a tool to allow, to like help people do their work better, to do their jobs and make their lives better and easier. And it's such a mindset shift from like kind of this almost fear approach of like, oh, a new technology is coming. I can't do anything with it to tying it back to the growth mindset of, oh, a new technology is coming. How can I use that to make my day better, to make our company better? Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Um, so those were kind of all the, like, the risk questions that I had. Um, we like to end kind of on this section called risk or that, which is kind of <laughs> just a goofy, uh, approach of, but, um, your other, but, uh, so my first one, so you work you work for Geico. Um, do you the Geico Gecko or the Geico Caveman? Gecko. Favorite mascot? Gecko. Yeah. <laughs> I've only but recently moved to Geico, so I don't have too much emotional involvement in either of the mascots. But I have been a consumer of Geico insurance for a long time, and I love okay. the Gecko ads. Okay, all right, good. I just I remember the the caveman commercial of them in an airport just riding on this little escalator and i just always laugh at that um a more real one now is uh do you when you think about your like cyber risk landscape in your organization um do you think most cyber risks tend to originate from actions taken by people within your organization or outside of your organization um, that's a great question. So again, I'll answer that in, in a more generic way and not to point to any specific organization, but I think I think external is a bigger threat than internal in terms of cyber risk, because I think that, you know, the, with the internal, we, I mean, it certainly is something we need to assess and address as well. But I think that for, there, there's a solution for the internal ones in terms of strengthening our control environment, um, you know, kind of staying ahead of that in terms of assessments and technology. And we've discussed some of those things before. But in terms of external, I think that's an ever-changing landscape, right? I think phishing, uh, phishing attacks, um, the, the hackers are becoming increasingly sophisticated. And I think that organizations um, are, for the most part, like most organizations, I mean, I don't want to use the word struggling because it doesn't mean that they're all, you know, subject to data breaches or anything like that. They're not struggling from that sense, but the, most organizations are needing to uh, invest in resources to combat that. And I think that, you know, there's, there's the, the the vulnerability piece of it, there's the securing par- parameters, like ops piece of it, and then there's the security education piece of it. There's the phishing monitoring piece of it, simulation piece of it. There's so many pieces and they're ever changing. And I think that's that definitely remains to be a threat to the organization and will continue to be one because um, there's so many different pieces that have to fall into place 
that only fall into place after an attack occurs. We cannot, like you said earlier, you you don't know what you don't know, right? So I think once an attack occurs, we learn from it. We release a patch. We you know update our tools and increase our training and have more examples for a fishing fishing simulation. But that's only an aftermath. So I think that, and and that doesn't mean I, I want to paint a negative picture of it. I think there's some tremendous work being done across organizations in terms of just how, like just awareness. You know, just that you would be surprised how much impact just security awareness creates on organizations. So I think there's certainly tools there that can help us, but that's that definitely remains to be a bigger threat, in my opinion. No, I appreciate that. That's awesome. Um, this isn't in the risk or that, but one thing that I wish I had asked during the growth mindset piece is, uh, what books do you recommend to people, uh, to learn just to like learn or, and it can be from professional, just general professional development, or I, I mean, I'd just be kind of personally interested in what I should read next. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, you know, I actually was an avid reader, but I have to admit that I have reduced my reading since my son was born simply because being a working mom and a leader and everything has taken up all of my time. Um, so there's there's a, quite a few books that are, that are on my on my radar. I do listen to some podcasts as well, but I love listening to inspirational leaders or reading about inspirational leaders. So, you know, I do read a lot of um, stuff about Barack Obama and just kind of strategizing his, and this isn't meant to be a political statement just strategizing his um you know thought process as a leader and understanding how he tackles problems and how he reacts to certain circumstances or situations when something happens in the country and how he reacts to it um i um i also love reading about like business leaders um you know just kind of like in biographies and in podcasts and ted talks and stuff so that's been more of my my thing lately than than books. Although I do want to eventually get back into reading more books. I do I do I do I still do read fiction books. My son's just started reading, and and I think now that's become a thing where it allows him to sit in one place for like half an hour, and, and mom gets to read a book for half an hour on the beach. So I think those um, I do keep up with, but but I think I also love reading books on like a positive mindset, like anything that is kind of encouraging you to to be strong and positive and tenacious because you are going to you know meet hurdles in your journey in your career and I think problem solving is is a big part of how you can be successful and how you can handle those problems so I think books on that I highly recommend I also um and this isn't kind of a book and it isn't what you asked but it's it's a tool nevertheless my husband does uh, a daily meditation and he um i need to do it he i i need to commit to it uh, but i i i have to admit that i haven't been as regular with it as he has but it's it's been something that i'm experimenting with and, and aiming to make it a more regular practice and i think it really drives your mindset tremendously like way more than you think right so i think it it really drives that your problems are not going away you're Challenges are not going away, but how are you looking at them? How are you tackling them? And kind of giving you that clarity of thought. I think is is very, very important as especially, you know, as you know, you work in areas where there's always stuff happening and there's always a new problem to solve. So I think that clarity of thought really helps. So I think that's a great tool as well. So anything positive, anything sort of growth mindset, I stay away from books that. I stay away from books that almost project like type A success on people. Like I just feel like, you know, I think it's very important to embrace diversity in leadership and growth. And when I say diversity, I don't necessarily mean racial or ethnic or language. Diversity of thought is what I mean, right? So I think I I I, nec- I don't necessarily um, I'm not a fan of books that kind of make you feel like you have to be a certain way. And then if you're a certain way and do certain things, you're going to be successful and you're going to be a millionaire. It's not like that. I think it's it's embracing who we are as humanity and it's um, embracing different thoughts and different ideologies and kind of taking them together. As a leader, I think our success lies in um, evolving our mind to understand how these different thoughts and different personalities and different people have a positive effect on your um, department, on your team, on your leadership style, on your strategy. So I think um, those those 
like I've, I've seen books and talks that kind of embrace that ideology. And I have, I know other leaders that I've worked with that embrace that and they've been very inspirational to me. So I didn't quite answer completely just books, but I just wanted to kind of go down that path of, you know, what inspires me and what, what do I um, recommend? No, I, I, I appreciate that. And um, for sure, things that I'm going to start to explore as part of my, my career. So thank you. Um, That's good. Those were all the questions I had. Any last thoughts for our listeners? Um, no, I think this was a fantastic discussion. And I encourage anybody that's, you know, trying to get into the GRC space um, to, to be open, learn, grow. I think it's a very exciting space. I'm also uh, open to mentoring. Um, I have mentored people on LinkedIn. So, you know, if I'm on LinkedIn, Raj P, um, look me up. I'm happy to kind of mentor any uh, folks that are trying to get into the GRC space or, you know, not necessarily from a job perspective, although I can do that as well, but just also from, you know, a career growth perspective and stuff like that. And I think I think it's a very exciting field. I think that it's um, a very balanced field. It's got a lot of scope for innovation. So I'm excited to see where it goes for the future. And I'm, I'm learning as it grows as well. Well, thank you so much, Praj. We loved having you. Um, And thanks for everyone listening. That's our show. Yeah, thank you. It was my pleasure to be here. Thanks so much, Chris.